morning, everyone, um, and thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, my name is Ivan Anderson, and I am a director in BDO's Financial Services Advisory Team. Um, I am joined here today by my colleague, um, Giovanni Giro. Um, the first thing I want to say is that from all of us at BDO, we hope that you and your respective teams, families, and loved ones are safe and well during this difficult time. Um, and for this morning's seminar, Giovanni will talk you through the um, IFR proposals and also how the FCA will implement these regulations in a post-Brexit world. And from what we have seen so far, the impacts of the IFR are, are, are wide-ranging and they will affect all firms with missed permissions from both a Pillar 1 capital perspective, Pillar 2 add-on perspective, as well as changes to governance or remuneration. We will also see um, um, new liquidity requirements being introduced and a transition from the ICAP into the ICARA. And overall, uh, these changes are likely to have an impact on all firms in some way, and for some firms, they will involve a significant change. It is therefore important for firms to carefully assess and, um, and embed these changes into their strategy. Um, Giovanni will talk for about 45 minutes this morning, and we will then have a sort of a 10, 15 minute QA session at the end. Uh, I just sort of finally want to touch on some housekeeping points. Um, and as you'll see on the next slide, uh, you know, there's an opportunity for uh, Q and A's. Um, and uh, you're more than welcome to, uh, you know, to, um, you know, to submit questions using the Q and A box at the bottom of the right hand side. I think please just ensure that you send the questions to all panelists when you do so. Um, also, today's webinar is going to be recorded and we will circulate the slides and the recording later. Your lines will be automatically muted throughout the, the webinar. Uh, and if you have any problems with the sound, uh, please let us know via the Q&A box. I will now hand over to um, Giovanni. Thank you, Ovin. Good morning, everyone. I hope everybody can hear me fine. I will now be going through the slides uh, and uh, looking at the agenda. What we will cover today is give an overview of the new regulation as it has been implemented and will be actually adopted in Europe, uh, looking at the key requirements and the key changes that will actually be introduced. We'll see what the approach will be in the UK, at least according to the latest uh, proposal by the FCA. We will look at uh, a couple of examples to look at the practical implications that uh, the key changes will have on certain types of firms. And then, of course, we'll have a chance to look at um, any questions that come from the audience and uh, pick those up at the end. So the new prudential legislation you, you will all have heard of by now uh, was introduced in December 2019. Um, by uh, adopting, well, uh, signing actually, a, a new investment firm directive and investment firm regulation. Uh, it's meant to be effective in all member states from the 26th of June uh, next year, but it will actually be adopted gradually through a five year transitional period to allow for full implementation uh, in uh, gradual terms, in stages, same as. Uh, it always happens with new European legislation like MIFID and CRD. Ovid mentioned some of the key uh, requirements, but generally, just to give you an overview, uh, the IFR will introduce um, different and generally higher base capital requirements. It has actually introduced a new definition of regulatory capital and how firms can ensure that they hold sufficient quality of capital to meet their requirements. We've introduced one of the key changes, which is the calculation of uh, variable capital under Pillar 1 on the basis of what uh, they call the K factors, certain parameters that we will look into in the next slide. And then different requirements, including liquidity, which is, uh, again, set as a new uh, fixed um, rule for all firms to comply with, but also regulatory reporting, risk management, uh, other uh, changes to prudential consolidation and the introduction of remuneration policies. So 
the reason we're picking this up uh, now is uh, because the FCA has recently published uh, a number of papers around uh, prudential supervision more broadly, but also more specifically uh, providing the technical interpretation of the uh, new regulation. So the latest paper we've looked at is the discussion paper that was published in June, where the FCA basically go through uh, each aspect of the regulation and how uh, they uh, intend to uh, potentially uh, apply those requirements in the UK. And this is in, uh, within kind of the context of a broader change to their approach to prudential supervision, where they have confirmed again uh, that uh, prudential supervision uh, will, will become uh, one of the key aspects of uh, their uh, regulatory objectives and will focus mainly on uh, aspects of firm businesses, including governance arrangements, risk management, but also at this specific time, the focus has shifted also to potential harm to consumers and how firms need to ensure they can prevent that. Business continuity and operational resilience, of course, at these times with the pandemic still running, that's one of the hot topics that firms need to be aware of. And then again, liquidity, as we mentioned, but also one recurring theme is wind-down planning. Uh, the FCA really uh, wants to focus on this aspect quite specifically. Now, post-Brexit, the, the UK will not be subject to uh, EU legislation anymore, so the IFR will not be implemented in that capacity within the UK. However, the Treasury have uh, made a commitment that they want to implement an equivalent regime in the UK to ensure that uh, equivalent standards are actually in place in the UK. And that's what the FCA has uh, basically covered in the discussion paper, explaining also what type of discretion and what type of uh, implementation changes they intend to make to the original regulation. So what firms will be actually affected by uh, the new regime? Uh, more generally, it will be all firms uh, that actually are authorized under MIFID. So all those firms that have MIFID permissions uh, in the UK and in Europe will be affected by the new regulation. In the UK, those will be generally categorized as if pre investment firms, by firms, uh, also fund managers like AIFMs and UCIS managers that have uh, MIFID permissions. And of course, CAD exempt firms that have uh, MIFID permissions generally for investment advice and reception and transmission of orders. Now, these are smaller firms that for the first time will come in scope of uh, a broader prudential regulation that have uh, not been in scope before. Uh, types of firms that will be affected by this, therefore, will be more investment banks, but also uh, wealth managers and fund managers advisors are rangers, as it said, and potentially more than ever anybody else, um, firms that deal on account, including high-frequency traders, CFD traders, and stockbrokers. There are some exclusions from the scope of the regulation, and um, the key ones include credit institutions, and that's mainly because banks and credit institutions will be regarded as uh, systemically important firms that need to remain in scope of the capital requirements directive and regulation. But also all those firms that do not have limited permissions, therefore insurance, insurance intermediaries, but also payment services providers, consumer credit firms will be out of scope. Similarly, fund managers without a limited top up or uh, limited exempt firms will not be in scope. Now, we know that some large investment banks that would be in scope of the IFR by default will not be because um, they are regarded as being systemically important and therefore they will continue to remain subject to uh, the capital requirement uh, rules under the new CRD5 and uh, CRR2. Uh, the firms that come in scope of the new regulation will be categorized under three classes depending on the permissions, but also certain uh, factors and parameters, depending on their size and uh, their trading activities. So as we said, some firms will remain in scope of the capital requirements directive, and these are uh, categorized as class one firms. 
these are systemically important uh, large firms that actually have an impact on the market and on industry, have large balance sheets, and uh, the threat over here is uh, 30 billion euros, but also uh, carry out bank-like activities. So they deal on our accounts and they do underwriting and placing with some commission basis. What will be important to note is that in terms of the coming scope of the IFR, are categorized as class 2 and class 3, and we will focus on these two for the rest of the presentation. So class 2 are all those large investment firms that meet certain thresholds, and we will look at these in a minute, and uh, also conduct specific activities. So that permission is the key driver to the uh, application of the rules and how they come in scope. Class 2 firms will be in scope of all IFR rules uh, without any restriction. A smaller category is Class 3, and these are non-systemic firms. These are defined as small and non-interconnected investment firms that have a simple business model, pose a lower risk to industry and to clients, and therefore can actually come in scope of the new regulations uh, with limited scope and some exemptions available. Like I said, there are specific thresholds that uh, determine how uh, a firm uh, can find its class uh, within the IFR. So uh, the list on the table includes all quantitative measures to determine whether a firm will be categorized as class two. Firms that meet any one of these uh, conditions and these thresholds uh, will have to be categorized as class two. As you can see, there are some measures that uh, refer to balance sheet size or uh, gross revenue, but also some uh, um, non-zero values that refer specifically to client money held or trading flow, which is uh, you know, a, a trading book activity. So even if uh, client money held, assets safeguarded, or uh, trading activities are greater than zero, these are sufficient to actually trigger uh, the firm being categorized as class two. All other firms that do not meet these thresholds and are below those thresholds will remain within class three and therefore will be in limited scope under the IFR. So the regulation uh, introduces, first of all, new capital requirements for investment firms and a new way of calculating uh, the pillar one rule-based uh, capital requirements. So, Pillar 1 remains a concept that is still uh, within the IFR as it comes from uh, the basal uh, concept of the three pillars. Uh, but here we see the split between uh, Class 2 and Class 3. So class 2 firms will have to hold the highest of the permanent minimum capital requirement, the fixed of the head requirement, and the K factor capital requirement. These three are the key components of class systems we need to calculate and uh, determine which one is the greater and then hold capital against it. Class three firms have a more limited capital requirement because they only need to consider permanent minimum capital and the fixed overhead requirement. It is immediately apparent that class three firms will not be subject to the K factor calculations and therefore uh, can refer specifically just to the fixed of the head and uh, minimum capital. Now, starting with the permanent minimum capital requirement, this applies to both class two and class three firms. However, there are three different levels that are driven by the activities and the permissions that firms actually hold. So the lowest uh, of the three is uh, 75,000 euros to be held by firms that do not hold crime money or assets and that carry out many activities, MIFID activities, including reception and transmission of orders, uh, execution of orders, portfolio management, investment advice. The largest of the three is instead a capital requirement of 750,000 euros. This basically replaces the 730,000 that is in the capital requirements regulation and refers specifically to firms that can deal on our accounts and can underwrite and place financial instruments with firm commitment. 
it's important to note that the uh, definition of dealing on an account will now include, uh, according to MIFID, all firms that deal as principal on a max principal basis. These firms under the capital requirements regulation are subject to lower uh, base capital requirements. However, under the ISR, they will be considered at the same level as the 750K firms and will be subject to that base capital requirement. All other investment firms that have uh, different permissions will be subject to a base capital requirement being the PMR of 150,000 euros. This will also include uh, MTF operators that do not have a billion or on account permission, for instance. Important to note that the quality of capital that we're referred to has been redefined uh, in the IFR. It doesn't um, uh, change too much from the concept and the definitions we have in capital requirements regulation. However, for those firms that were used to, for instance, having a tier three component in the regulatory capital, this will no longer be present and they will not be able to actually consider that as regulatory capital. We move to the fixed overhead requirement then. So this is the second component that is common to both class two and class three firms. Again, the definition is fairly similar to what firms are already familiar with, which is one quarter of the fixed overhead of the preceding year. So all fixed expenses that are confirmed in a firm's financial statement uh, will be the key driver and then holding one quarter of that will satisfy the fixed overhead requirement. Now, the IFR defines the exclusions in the same way as uh, the capital requirement regulation. So any bonus or variable remuneration will be excluded, but also fair commission or profit shares and fees to tied agents will be excluded. These are variable components that are already in the definition. Additional exclusions have been introduced by, uh, by the IFR. So now, other variable items will be removed from the fixed overhead. And it's raw materials expenses, contract-based profit and loss transfer agreements, but also losses incurred while dealing on an account and also tax costs. These can actually be excluded from the fixed overhead for the purpose of the fixed overhead requirement. And now we move to the third component, which is the K-factor requirement. This is only applicable to class two firms, as we showed a bit earlier. And it's one of the major innovations that come from the IFR. So this capital requirement is actually based on specific coefficients and metrics that apply to uh, specific underlying values that depend on the types of activities that firms carry out but also the size and volume of those activities. The key components of the case factor calculations uh, refer to three main categories of risk, including risk to client, risk to market, and risk to firm. One of the key objectives of the new regulation is to focus mostly on the risks that are posed by the firm to customers and to the market. So these are the key components that need to be analyzed in the first instance. Risk to firm is also important, but that mainly refers to internal operational risk and uh, concentration risk, as well as large exposures. We will look at this in more detail, just uh, picking up some examples of how the case factors are actually assessed and what base values need to be considered and uh, determined in value when gener uh, generating the KFR. It should be mentioned that uh, the discussion paper specifies that uh, ESG, so environmental, social, and governance issues, are uh, also being considered, and the EBA is actually planning to potentially introduce additional coefficients to actually cover uh, these uh, additional risks that may be posed to the market and to clients. So looking at the risk to client case factors, we have uh, the asset under management uh, component that uh, basically looks at all assets managed under a discretionary arrangement or non-discretionary, so even under an advisory 
agreement with clients. It includes assets, uh, the management of which has been delegated to other firms. But also it's important to note a couple of points. For ASIMs and ESIS managers with MISIS emissions capitalized as PCMIs, there will be no double counting because basically they will already consider assets under management within the requirements driven by AISMD and the ESIS directive. The IFR paper actually doesn't specify how negative values on a portfolio will be uh, actually uh, calculated and considered. But technically, it's likely that any liabilities will be deducted from the total value. The asset uh, safeguard that I mean covers all those assets that the firm is actually safeguarding on behalf of clients that are valued at market value and, if that's not possible, at uh, on, on a best effort basis. It's important to note that this includes assets that are uh, with a third party, but also assets that have been received by the firm in custody from other firms. So the value, the base value actually expands to uh, all those assets that are either passed to a third custodian or, or, or also passed to the uh, firm by other firms. Finally, we have the client money um, held uh, component. This one in the IFR includes all client money accounts uh, that are both segregated and non-segregated. Now, in the UK, there's no um, uh, opportunity for firms to actually hold client money in non-segregated accounts due to the cash requirements. Therefore, this element will not be relevant. But importantly, of course, it removes uh, any uh, client money that is only controlled for a Monday. But it also looks at how firms consider any money that is held on behalf of professional clients under a type of transfer collateral agreement. These are likely to be included in the CMA's component, even if technically in the cash rules, PTCA uh, excludes the definition of client money uh, for the purpose of cash itself. So this is going to be an addition to um, the ECMA that is different from what CAS actually states. The last one of the risk of client components is based on client orders handled, which is client uh, orders that are received on the market or uh, orders that are being received and transmitted. Now, it includes transactions executed under delegated portfolio management, but also any uh, transactions from advisory arrangements that are not covered by the assets under management uh, component. There's no double counting in the IFR, so again, anything that is included in a different case factor and already covers the specific risk will not be uh, repeated under a different case factor. Moving to risk to market, we have two components. So the net position risk case factor, which is based on the value of the trading book, so the positions held by a firm dealing on our account on a trading book. And then, uh, all of those all of the values will actually be calculated basically as so the same way as uh, the market risk uh, component in, in the CLR. So no major change there. ECMG is uh, the, basically the uh, component, the case factor that is based on to remember guarantees, and this is where firms actually deal with uh, central counterparties to a clear member, and of course have to hold. Uh, the uh, a margin with the current member in order to be able to execute uh, those transactions. This is alternative to the CMPR uh, in case uh, firms are actually dealing uh, on the same book differently. We move to risk the firm. So these are uh, the three case factors that apply to uh, risk the firm and include basically the daily, daily trading flow. This is specific, again, to firms that deal on all accounts and run a trading book and will be measured as the total value of trade at the end of each day. The coefficient could be applied to cash trade, and uh, in this case, the value is uh, the amount paid over the of trade, but also uh, in derivatives trade, 
the value of reference is the notional amount of contract, which in uh, certain cases can be quite sizable. Then we have the key TCB, which is the potential risk of default of trading counterparties. Uh, the calculation is basically the same as uh, what we have under counterpart credit risk in the CRR. However, there are formulas that are simplified in the IFR that refer again to exposure values and uh, explain which trades are actually to be included in the calculation. And finally, we have concentration risk. So, again, trading book, large exposures to a single counterparty or groups of connected parties are going to be the value of reference. And technically, this again is uh, very similar to the large exposures regime that is included in the CRR, with some small variations to the thresholds that are being applied. This is, uh, in, in a nutshell, what base values of reference terms we need to use when we calculate the case factor component. Another one of the financial resources requirements that firms will be subject to is the liquidity requirements imposed by IFR. There will be a minimum requirement based on uh, one third of the fixed overhead requirements. This basically equates to one month's work of fixed overhead. And firms will need to hold eligible liquid assets against this. Now, the IFR specifies exactly which liquid assets are actually eligible to meet the requirement. But also, there's a point in the IFR that says that class three firms can actually be exempted from this requirement. Now, as you see in the notes at the bottom, the FCA in its discussion paper is assuming that class three firms will also be subject to those liquidity requirements without exception. There are some elements of the uh, liquid requirements uh, that come from the CLR and uh, repeat similar uh, aspects, including the definition of high quality liquidity assets, but also uh, refer specifically to uh, assets that come directly from the CRR, like unencumbered or on cash and short term deposits. Class three firms will have uh, some different categories of assets that can be included that are short term and uh, have uh, been subject and will be subject to a specific haircut. So moving on, having looked at the financial resources requirements in the IFR, we're going to look briefly at a couple of examples just to see how uh, things will change for some firms. So if we look at uh, a wealth manager that is currently categorized as an IFRU 1 to 5K limited license firm, they will currently be subject to the greater of 125,000, the sum of credit and market risk, and the fixed overhead requirements. So moving into the IFR, this type of firm will be categorized as a class two firm because they can hold client money, and we've made this assumption in the example. The minimum capital requirements will increase to 150,000 euros. We'll need to calculate a fixed overhead requirement uh, with the new deductions defined in the IFR. And most of all, they will need to calculate a key factor matrix based on their activities and determine the final uh, all funds requirement, uh, comparing it with the fixed overhead requirement and the minimum cap. So if we look at the key components of the case factors that we need to consider, risk to clients basically triggers all of the coefficients because we'll assume that they have assets under management both on a mandatory and, uh, on, sorry, on a discretionary and non-discretionary basis. But also, they will hold client money and assets, so uh, the key coefficients in this area will also um, be applied. Client order handled will be uh, another one of the factors that will need to be included. And again, the coefficients will apply here because the firm will be executing orders on behalf of clients or receiving and transmitting orders for them. Differently, if we look at risk to market and risk to firm, because the firm will not be uh, running a trading book, will not be dealing on an account, none of these uh, K factors will be applicable. And we have a trading book definition at the bottom just to uh, define specifically uh, what uh, positions and what trades are included. 
So if we come to the conclusion of this example, again, without calculating specifically uh, the impact of these coefficients to the precise capital requirements, we know that under the camera regime, the key risks under pillar one are credit and market. Uh, the six overhead requirement is more likely to be uh, the main requirement at the moment. And the size of portfolios managed is actually not directly affecting pillar one uh, requirements. Uh, other than, uh, you know, indirectly and marginally. So what EIFR intends to achieve is apply a more proportionate and uh, bespoke approach to the calculation of the risks that the firm poses to industry and to clients. So now the asset under management, client money, and uh, asset safeguard components are all key factors that will become key drivers of capital requirements. And there's an additional factor that trade involvement in terms of execution of orders on behalf of clients will become uh, one of the parameters to be used. So potentially, under the IFR, the case factors uh, requirement may be greater than the fixed overhead requirement. In this instance, the capital requirement will become more proportional to the size of portfolios and the, the orders handled, rather than just fixed expenses, which makes, again, the objective uh, achievable for the purpose of the IFR in tailoring the requirements to the activities of the firm and their exposures to the market. So if we move on to just another type of firm, uh, looking at uh, what um, an IFPRO 730K full scope firm would be doing under the IFR, at present, they would only be subject to a base capital requirement of 730,000 euros and uh, the sum of credit plus market plus operational risk. Again, similarly to the previous examples, this firm will fall into class two because they can deal on an account and therefore meet the threshold. And for the first time, that we need to calculate the fixed of the head requirement, but also the key factors uh, requirement and apply all the metrics that are relevant to the activities that the firm actually carries out. So again, Doing the same exercise as earlier, if we look at the risk decline, in this case, there are some of these that do not apply because there will be no discretionary management permissions and no safeguarding of assets potentially. We have assumed that the firm will be holding client money in segregated accounts, so this case factor will be triggered. So what we need to focus on uh, more is risk to market and risk to firm. So because the firm runs a trading book, uh, the net position risk will be a component that is triggered by the K factor standard, and it will be calculated in the same way as a standardized market risk under the CLR. When we look at the risk to firm, basically all components will be triggered. So all the coefficients we have will apply. There will be daily trading flows that will be measured, and uh, those will actually determine potentially one of the highest component, uh, one of the highest pay factors in this, guy, in, in this case. But then we need to cover risk of uh, defaults of trading counterparties and concentration risk. Both of these will also apply, again, because of some deals on our account, but also may be uh, exposed to uh, large exposures to individual clients uh, or groups of connected clients. Again, the large exposures component under concentration risk is very similar to what uh, Sierra does at the moment. So if we look at what this means for full scope firm and how they will transition into the IFR, so right now, potentially the key requirements are driven by operational risk and market risk. These will be uh, likely the largest components in the variable capital. But they don't currently calculate the fixed overhead requirements because there's no need for them. Under the IFR, the key components will become the key factors linked to trading flows, uh, particularly high for high frequency traders and other limit traders, but also net position risk, time money held, uh, concentration risk will be additional factors that will uh, change uh, the requirements for these firms. They will need to calculate fixed overhead requirements now and also hold liquid assets of at least one third of the fixed overhead requirement, although we expect that these will be exceeded in a firm that becomes um, uh, a full scope or class two under the 750K regime. So in summary, as you can see, 
some things will change uh, more substantially for certain types of firms, but more importantly, independently from uh, the activities that they carry out, there will be case factors that apply differently to that, and this is how the IFR achieves a better tailoring and a more uh, proportionate approach, calculating the risk component in terms of capital requirements. Uh, I've been mentioned at the beginning that um, there will be a transition from what today is called an ICAP. It will become an internal capital adequacy and risk assessment. Basically, firms will need to have uh, documented all of their risk management, capital adequacy procedures uh, in a similar way to what you have seen with the ICAP with some variations. This is still under the Pillar 2 uh, component. And uh, this is the element that is the risk-based assessment for risks that are not captured under Pillar 1. Uh, firms would need to first focus on risk to client and risk to market and then determine the knock-on effects that these may have on the firm. The ICAR needs to be proportional to the business model, but also uh, what is interesting is that the uh, discussion paper says that even SNIs that would not apply the case factors will need to do so in the ITARA, so they can find the way around the risk assessment by applying the same key factors we've looked at earlier. Harm on clients will be the main focus, but again, you know, the key topics that will be included in the ITARA will include uh, business continuity and then wind-down planning, stress testing, in a similar way as uh, the FCA has actually uh, applied potential supervision and intends to apply going forward. PREP will be also uh, a type of review that the FCA will keep using and will potentially impose additional requirements in the same way as they do now under the ICG and the CPD. Class 3 firms are expected to be fully in scope of the ITAR requirements, but also liquidity and threat. This is a more stringent approach than the IFR says, and this is part of what the FCA intends to do in terms of implementation in the UK and applying a credential regime that is equivalent, but even more stringent than the IFI itself. Liquidity risk assessment now will not be on a standalone uh, liquidity risk policy or an ILA, but it will be included within the ITAR itself. So liquidity and all of its components, as we're used to seeing in an ILA, will be within the ITAR. This gives a more comprehensive and kind of holistic view of the financial resources requirements and risk exposures, all within the same uh, assessment within the, the same document. The risks to be considered, of course, include um, you know, cash flows and potential uh, outflows that uh, cannot be managed or monitored, but also intraday uh, exposures like margin calls and uh, timely settlement, and other risks of uh, incurring um, unexpected costs or unexpected obligations under redress or uh, potentially um, uh, other losses that are incurred by clients. Transferability of liquid assets is an important element because, of course, uh, liquid assets will need to be made available as uh, they become uh, indispensable for the firm. So this will be a component that needs to be assessed in the ITAR itself. And then stress testing, same as in the ICAP, will need to include liquidity. This is one thing that has not changed from uh, the capital requirements regulation. The ICAP technically will include all the components that we're used to seeing in an ILA, and one single document will cover for all. We move on to potential consolidation. Now, this is an important point because uh, where groups are identified in Europe, under the capital funds regulation, there will be potential consolidation and uh, different levels of obligations applicable. Under the IFR, if uh, a new consolidation group has been identified, the important thing is that uh, the EU parent undertaking, whether it's regulated or unregulated, will become directly responsible for the potential obligations at the consolidated level and will need to have the controls and the monitoring system to ensure that capital is being held within the group. Class two and class three firms will be in scope, and if they are within a consolidation group, there will be exempt cap firms, for instance, that will become in scope of these requirements. 
the parents of a group become, uh, as we said, uh, the main firm responsible for uh, group consolidation, will be able to run a group capital attack that kind of assesses the leveraging or risk posed to uh, holding capital. And satisfying that attack might prevent full consolidation of the planning. Uh, in this case, the CRR excludes the application of the base capital requirement uh, at a group level, whereas the IFR will apply this. So if we have a firm that deals on our accounts that is a 750K firm, the 750K uh, permanent minimum requirement will apply on a group-wide basis, so it will become the base requirement for the whole group. And then other aspects will need to be extended to, to the group altogether. One of which is, of course, the state factor consideration to consider that component of the group's capital requirement. But also the ICARA will need to be done uh, on, a, on a group basis. Uh, governance arrangements, risk management framework will need to be group-wide. But also mandatory disclosures and remuneration policies will apply to the group. What we are seeing is that uh, already the um, uh, I, you know, suspicions basically that post-Brexit, uh, the application of uh, consolidation or consolidated rules across the board, particularly between um, group entities that sit in different member states, will pose difficulties in uh, applying enforcement by the competent regulator to either the parent that sits in another jurisdiction or to uh, investment firms that are subsidiaries in different jurisdictions as well. This is something that will need to be looked into in further consultations. Finally, another couple of slides covering uh, other requirements that come from the IFR. So governance, risk management, and remuneration. Again, these are topics that um, have come through. And the key requirements um, in reality, as the note says at the bottom, are quite similar to what the UK already has. So most Fiscal investment firms, mutual investment firms will be familiar with this concept. It has just been extended to uh, a, a European core through the ISR. So maintaining robust governance arrangements, a clear structure, organizational um, structures as well, is uh, one of the key requirements in the ISR. But these are all rules that uh, are already in the FISC source book for UK firms. Similarly, the remuneration uh, policies in the way that new requirements have been set in the IFR, uh, these will need to be documented. There will be fixed variable ratio limits that apply and pay out limits as well. And uh, also, fewer exemptions under proportionality. Uh, this is slightly different, but again, it's uh, very similar to what the UK remuneration code already does in the UK and most firms will be familiar with this. Class three investment firms will be exempt from these requirements specifically. Finally, regulatory reporting and disclosure requirements. Again, regulatory reporting will cover all those aspects that uh, are kind of new instructions from the IFR. So it will include disclosure of the key factor calculations and all of the risk components. It will be particularly similar to uh, the core of returns that UK firms are familiar with. On the disclosure side, uh, basically class C firms will uh, also be familiar with this because they replicate a pillar three statement, basically. And the key information to be included includes risk management, on fund, capital requirements, calculations, and remuneration disclosures that are already covered by the current pillar three requirements. Now, class three firms will not be fully in scope of these uh, specific requirements, but they will have some reporting requirements, and also uh, will potentially be excluded, to, uh, excluded from uh, the full public disclosure requirement. So, coming to the end of this brief presentation, um, there's a summary here of all of the key changes that we've gone through. So. As we saw, base capital requirements have increased. Firms will need to, again, demonstrate their ability to calculate pay factors. But also we've seen important changes, the uh, adoption of the ICARA as a new, uh, new ICAP and also uh, specific requirements that come from the IFR. 
firms affected, as we said, exam cap firms will be subject to these requirements for the first time, and they will be affected probably uh, more severely than other firms. But then asset managers, wealth managers, uh, traders, safety traders, and much principal brokers will all be affected to some extent on the basis of how the K-factors are calculated in respect of the activities that carry out. Consolidation, as we said, is going to be slightly different, and importantly, it introduces a direct responsibility of uh, the head of a UK consolidation group or a European consolidation group uh, for all the obligations that apply at the consolidation level. This is new and uh, quite important, and we need to be looking into when uh, planning for consolidation under the IFR. And then, as I said, the FCA is not planning to apply any uh, major discretions or uh, exemptions, and potentially, again, the UK regime will be more stringent than uh, it will be in other member states. Remuneration policy and liquidity requirements are also covered by the IFR, but as we said, the requirements are relatively simple, and most firms will be able to actually satisfy these. So we come to the end of the session, and I will hand you back to uh, Oivin for the Q&A. Well, thank you very much, uh, Giovanni, for uh, you know for talking us through this. We have um, you know quite a few questions coming in, um, uh, so I thought we could perhaps spend the last sort of ten minutes or so, uh, you know, talking through some of the uh, um, you know questions we've had from for, you know from people um, uh, on the phone. Um, and the first question is, uh, uh, will there be continued reporting of assets encumbrance um, and the, uh, um, I guess, the leverage ratio under the, um, uh, under the IFR? And um, I guess I can answer that. <laughs> so assets encumbrance, there's no, uh, at least to my knowledge, there's no um, sort of requirement to report asset encumbrance in a sort of co rep style template. Um, and, uh, and similarly, with, you know, with the leverage ratio, it's simply not in scope. However, I think the concepts of asset encumbrance and leverage ratio won't necessarily go away. So you may want to consider that as part of your pillar two assessment in the ICARA. Um, so that's the answer to that question. Um, we also have another question uh, uh, around um, will recovery and resolution plans still be required? And as some of you may know, uh, recovering resolution plans are not covered by um, the IFR and the IFD, just as they're not covered by BIPRU or by the CRR, CRD4. So the provisions from the uh, BRRD for the, the, the sort of the, um, the recovering resolution plan directive uh, will still continue to apply. That's the assumption. Uh, and I think the FCA has um, you know, stated that as well. Um, I think one thing to note, though, is, is the, the sort of wind-down plan, which I guess is linked to kind of the recovery and resolution part. Certainly, the resolution part is now weaved into the um, uh, uh, ICARA. Um, so that's a couple of questions. I'm just looking here. There's a few more. Um, one of the questions we have is um, around uh, the KCON, so the KCON factor. Do we have to calculate um, that uh, up front, or is it only if you have the kind of the soft limits um, uh, imposed by the um, by the uh, 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 if you sort of breach the soft limits imposed by the FCA? So I'm not sure, uh, Giovanni, if you um, um, uh, want, want want to answer that. Yeah, sure. Um, my understanding is that the discussion paper states that yes, you first need to breach the soft limit. So. Uh, concentration will only be met and calculated as a case factor once either the 25% or the 100% or any of the other thresholds have been actually crossed uh, in terms of large exposures. So at that point, the case factor will become a component. While firms uh, are below those thresholds in, um, uh, when, when, you know, on the trading book, uh, the, the KCON uh, component will remain zero. Excellent, thank you. Um, and there's a few more um, more questions coming in here. So uh, there's there's one question around the um, uh, you know, um, someone's looked at the uh, FCA discussion paper, 
um, and asking if the, the title transfer financial collateral agreement arrangements, also referred to as the TTCA, would be considered on an individual investment firm's basis um, uh, under the um, under the uh, um, uh, under risk management governance and uh, uh, sort of review process, and not under the KCMH for the client money held. Uh, uh, what's your your view on that, Giovanni? Yeah, actually, going through again the discussion paper. Uh, this is the general approach, so we, we agree that um, uh, TTCAs uh, will be uh, assessed on an individual firm basis uh, on a case-by-case -case basis. But there's uh, a couple of comments in the discussion paper that basically say that the FCA is more keen to consider all money that is being actually handled or held by firms on behalf of clients, uh, whether in segregated accounts or under a TTCA agreement to be included in the TCMH. This is mainly to determine the size of the base value, also driven by time money that is not recognized by CAS as such, but is still money that the firm is actually uh, holding and managing on behalf of clients, even if it is professional clients under a TTCA. Again, this is still under consultation, so it's not set in stone, but this seems to be the direction the FCA wants to take in the full implementation stages. Excellent. Thank you, Giovanni. Um, there's a couple of more questions to hear, you know, that's come in. Uh, some of them are a bit sort of more, more, I guess, more fundamental. So one of the questions there is around, will the requirements calculated through the case factors replace the Pillar 2 capital requirements? What, what, what's your view on that, Giovanni? Um, yeah, that's a question that has come up before, and actually uh, the answer is no. So the components are still Pillar 1 and Pillar 2. When a firm calculates the capital requirements, they need to go through both stages. And the K factors themselves uh, only sit within the Pillar 1 component. So even if the kind of the range of uh, types of risks and uh, base values is greater than they used to have previously under Pillar 1, Still, this doesn't replace the full risk assessment that the firm still needs to undertake under the ICAR approaches, and then assess any additional risk that, again, are not fully captured under Pillar 1, their financial impact, and how they can affect the capital requirements of the firm. So, no, case factors will still sit within the Pillar 1 base requirements. One thing that I mentioned earlier, I think, in the presentation is that, like I said, Firms that do not use case factors in the first instance because they're not subject to them should consider both same uh, parameters and metrics in their risk assessment. So it's helpful for firms that will be in scope of the ICARA to run the risk assessment on the basis of the same types of risk as under the case factors. Okay, thank you very much, Giovanni. Um, there's a final question here that we have on uh, uh, on prudential consolidation. So the question asks, uh, you know, how will prudential consolidation be applied consistently in a cross-border group where the IFR has been implemented differently um, uh, in member states? So for example, uh, I guess the UK is considered here as well, but let, let's, let's say UK, Cyprus, or UK, Germany. Uh, do you have any thoughts on that? Uh, yeah, sure. I mean, that's a very good question because this is a point that will probably cause some debate in the future. And we mentioned earlier that, yeah, that might be uh, a question of um, jurisdictions and, you know, competent authorities understanding who will be responsible for potential supervision for the group. But technically, after the exit from uh, the European Union, the UK will need to consider equivalent standards and then uh, liaise with other European regulators to understand who will be responsible for potential supervision of the consolidation group. As we said, parent undertakings and subsidiaries sitting in different European member states will find themselves in a situation where they need to determine who the competent authority is and then remain subject to consolidated requirements under that authority. Again, this will be under consultation and definitely will be one of the points that will be picked up uh, upon full implementation of the regulation. Excellent. Well, thank you very much, Giovanni. I think that we have, you know, had some really good questions. I think we're sort of getting towards the end of our 
our webinar. So I think for us, it's time to, um, you, know, to you know, to wrap up. Um, and I just want to, you know, to share some sort of final thoughts with you. Um, we have had quite a lot of questions, actually, uh, uh, and obviously we won't have time to answer everyone's questions today. But we commit to do so directly with you uh, following this, web, you know, this uh, webinar. So we have uh, all the questions, uh, you know, um, uh, sort of, you know, recorded in our system. So we will respond to each one of you individually. Uh, and also, would like to say thank you very much to everyone for, for you know, for listening today and uh, submitting excellent questions. Um, and as I said earlier, we are recording this webinar. Uh, and we will be sending you a copy of the recording and the slides over the coming days. I would expect that to you know, be either later today or tomorrow. Um, and also, I want to uh, thank Giovanni uh, um, and Lauren for uh, uh, you know, uh, presenting and you know, preparing uh, today's webinar. There's quite a lot of work going into this. Uh, and finally, and most importantly, thank you all very, very much for joining us this morning. Uh, I hope the webinar was, uh, uh, you know, was interesting and useful, and I wish you all a very nice and safe uh, 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 remainder of the day. So thank you very much, and we are going to go uh, um, and dial off now. So thank you again, everyone.